There we go. Well, uh, welcome again. Um, I'm Mark Goldstein. I'm the uh, chairman of uh, Health Hub. Um, my day job is I'm actually a venture capitalist and I invest in digital health companies. Um, and so this is really everything I do. I love this stuff and I'm, you know, we're getting, it's getting super exciting that we're only a week or, a week or so away, actually now a week from our uh, final event. This is our seventh of 14 sessions um, where we're talking basically semifinal sessions, category by category, where we let the top four companies in each category basically show off their stuff, moderated by two experts. A um, little bit about Health Hub. Health Hub, uh, we are based in Mission Bay, typically. Um, we think of the UCSF and where we are at is we are at the center of uh, healthcare innovation worldwide. Um, our job at Health Hub is to, base, is to help healthcare companies, specifically digital health companies, scale and grow. If that means find them investors, if it means find them advisors, if it means educate, it means putting on an award show, we'll do whatever it takes. And that's our goal as, a, as, an, as an organization. As an organization, we are uh, sponsored by about 20, it's now 22 different venture capitalists. So each of these venture firms uh, makes donations on an annual basis and that pays all of our bills. Um, the venture firms obviously want to get as close to those next great companies. And so they see being a part of Health, uh, Health Hub as part of their mission. For our awards event, we also have some great sponsors, uh, include Wilson Sonsini, we all know about Wilson City, top law firm in the industry. NTT, uh, the largest, uh, second, second largest telecommunications company in the world. Novartis, specifically their biome, uh, which is their accelerator. Lavongo and uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And we couldn't do it without them. And we thank our sponsors and we're uh, really thankful for uh, the resources that we have to put on events like this. Okay, so what are we going to do today before we get into the um, agenda. Well, I'm going to take a step back and talk about um, how did we get here? Well, we got here. Um, it took three months. We have 250 judges. We have gone through over 750 qualified submissions. And we've ended up now with about 32 companies that are amazing, all amazing companies, all of our semifinalists. This is the hospital diagnostics category. We've gone through a first round and a second round and also a semifinal round and here we are today. So it's been a lot of work and, it's, and there's been uh, four or five people behind the scenes and amazing submissions by the companies. So how do we judge these companies and how do we get here with these four amazing companies? Um, in our first round, we spent a lot of time thinking about validation and traction. We wanted to make sure that the companies that were going to be our semifinalists and gonna be our winners were companies that we felt comfortable about recommending to clinics, to healthcare systems, and to providers around the country. That meant their products had to be in market, and their products had to be validated. In our second round, after we got, we ended up coming down to 140 companies, we focused on a few other criteria. 10 of the 50 points were associated with value to customers. How important is it what this company is doing? Is this, how many lives are you saving? How important is it to how many, uh, is this just a very, very bespoke uh, uh, rare disease solution? Or is this something that basically touches, you know, tens of millions of diabetics? Level of innovation. How innovative is the company? Has the company, is the company a fast follower or does the company really have a great patent portfolio? And is, is how impressive is that? Again, validation is super important. So if it, you know, beyond FDA validation, tell us about your clinical trials. We want to make sure that you really, your, what it is you're talking about really, really, really works. And that's what our judges are going to be looking for. Market traction, also important. How many hospital systems, how many clinics, how many people are using your product today? The more, the merrier. Now, um, it, le it le leads us to the last one, which is level differentiation, where that's what goes on today. We're going to help the companies tease, them, tease it out a little bit. How are they different? How are they different from their peers? How are they different from companies that are maybe solving different needs for different departments for different sectors? And so companies all got graded, graded by these 50 points and that's how, that's how it, we got here. Now, I get to introduce two people, Paul Grant and Daniel Burnett. Now, Paul um, is someone I've now known for a few years. He runs MedTech Innovator. I'll let him tell you all about that. Um, we run a panel with Paul um, called Hospital to Home. It's been really successful. 
And uh, Paul at MedTech Innovator has been, I think it was how many companies? Seven or eight of his companies were in the quarterfinals, which I think there was no other accelerator incubator that delivered that many companies. So hats off to Paul. Daniel Burnett. Daniel is on the board of directors at UCSF Health Hub. He runs an accelerator right off campus here in Mission Bay. Um, he has started an untold number of, uh, of medical device companies, and he's going to tell you all about it. So with that, I'm going to introduce you first to Paul. Thank you very much, Mark. Good to, uh, good to be back and working with you again uh, to support innovative companies. So hi, I'm Paul Grand, CEO here at MedTech Innovator. As Mark was mentioning, we are an accelerator for medical technology. We're actually the largest accelerator in the world for medical devices. Uh, we also have a large number of companies in digital and diagnostics as well. Um, and uh, in fact, as you mentioned, a number of our companies are, we're in the quarterfinals, have advanced to the semifinals here, which I'm very excited about. Looking forward to rooting for all of them. A couple of them are competing against each other in some of these categories. So, you know, we're a little conflicted, but, uh, but all that aside, uh, we're very excited about this opportunity to celebrate some of the semifinals here today in this particular category. You know, we're very, you know, we'll talk more about these companies in a minute, but I was just gonna say, you know, these are companies that are just making a huge difference on how care is, is being delivered. You know, the transformation that um, these companies are driving is something that's really gonna impact all of our lives. Um, I'm also really proud to uh, have uh, Dan Burnett on uh, following me now as a moderator. Dan, uh, as you know, you mentioned, is an incredible serial entrepreneur and investor, but also uh, is a MedTech innovator, uh, part of the family as well. He's had, I think, three of his companies as part of the MedTech Innovator Program. So terrific to be working with Dan. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, Dan. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> and thanks, Mark, too. It's, uh, uh, as Mark had mentioned, I've been with UCSF Health Hub since the inception as a board member, and it's been uh, great to watch the journey. Also, really um, glad to be here with all these amazing companies, and uh, of course, in great company with Paul. So. Um, Theranova uh, is a, a we, we called it a medical device incubator, but I've been told that it's a medical a venture studio, actually, because most of the technologies are internally hatched and uh, we grow them internally. We also have started a, a collaboration with UCSF uh, Surgical Innovations Program. So those are the only technologies that we've taken in that have been external to Theranova. But we've been doing this now, um, I think, 17 years or so. And met Paul way back when he was on the venture side of things. Um, so glad to still be working with you. The, um, and so a bunch of different companies, this is quite outdated as is the picture. Not, not sure where you found that one, Mark, but I didn't have many gray hairs back then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we've had 14 companies that have spun out now um, over the last 16 or so years. So. We've been, it runs the gamut from implantables to digital health. So uh, happy to be here and uh, happy also to be um, moderating this panel with these amazing companies. Great, so I'll let you guys kick it off. I'm gonna, uh, like I said, I'm gonna be super quiet. Great. So um, the first two companies up are gonna be uh, uh, Jason Bellet with Echo and Eric with Grail. So first off, let's uh, hand it over to Jason to talk about Echo for us. Absolutely, well, good afternoon, everyone, and amazing group to be a part of, so thanks for having us. My name's Jason, uh, Chief Customer Officer and Co-Founder at Echo. I'll keep it short, at a really high level, we're helping providers better detect and monitor heart disease using the tool that's worn around the neck of 30 million uh, healthcare providers around the world, which is the stethoscope. It's amazing that in 2020, uh, we're using a rubber tube with a metal chest piece as our frontline tool to pick up structural heart disease, atrial fibrillation, uh, and uh, eventually heart failure. And we have these 30 seconds built into every single physical exam. Our goal as a company is to maximize those 30 seconds where the stethoscope is placed on the chest to help the, the provider using AI detect AFib, detect aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. And through our partnership with the Mayo Clinic, actually be able to detect heart failure. We have a breakthrough FDA indication uh, for that use case. So we have about 70,000 providers across 4,000 hospitals using our technology every day uh, to more effectively screen patients. We've seen a huge spike during COVID 
uh, as providers and patients have been moved even far further away from each other, the need for enhanced screening has become even more important. Uh, and we're, we're excited about uh, continuing the journey as we try to get this around the neck of, of those 30 million providers around the world. Great, Great. thanks. Um, excellent technology, uh, huge need. So um, next is another amazing company, Grail, uh, that'll, and Eric will discuss that with us now. Yes, and thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be here, and I'm really honored to be uh, in this group to get today. So Grail is pioneering uh, the concept of cancer detection by developing a multi-cancer early detection blood test. And so I think, as we all know, cancer is about to become the, the leading cause of mortality worldwide. And every day, uh, 1,700 people die from cancer. And much of that stems from the fact that we detect cancer too late. And so while there are cancer screening paradigms which have been highly successful, we don't screen for the vast majority of cancers that do arise. And so our ability to detect cancer through a blood test uh, is going to revolutionize um, mortality from cancer. And so we have uh, recently published a landmark paper in Annals of Oncology where we described our development work. We're in the middle of a study called Pathfinder in which the test is being implemented uh, <clears throat> in multiple institutions across the country and results are being returned to uh, patients and physicians. And additionally, we have breakthrough status with the FDA where we are having our conversations around how this novel paradigm of blood testing for multiple cancer types uh, can revolutionize the way we think about cancer detection. Terrific. Thank you for that, uh, Eric and Jason. We've got two more companies to go in this category. So again, this is Best Hospital Diagnostics. Uh, so uh, next up, we're going to have Charlie Taylor from HeartFlow. So tell us about HeartFlow, Charlie. Great, thank you. Well, uh, one of our objectives is to, uh, to make cancer the leading cause of death because right now heart disease is, and, um, and we're trying to knock it down uh, from its uh, first place. You know, by far more people die of heart disease than any other, any other disease. Uh, HeartFlow's technology is unique. We take CT data out of a hospital, um, securely uh, upload it to our cloud uh, application running on Amazon Web Services. We use deep learning AI to extract information about coronary artery disease. You can't diagnose coronary artery disease if you never see the coronary arteries and if you never see atherosclerosis or plaque. If you do that, and if you can actually manage and, and understand uh, the significance of coronary disease, uh, then patients are much better treated. Uh, when our technology is used in clinical practice, it reduces subsequent invasive tests by, you know, about 60% of patients have invasive diagnostic tests canceled, and then they're safely treated. Um, in uh, studies now, again, over 400 peer review papers, uh, studies with data, clinical data on over 10,000 patients and long-term outcome data on 6,000 patients. We've demonstrated based upon a negative heart flow test, it's safe to defer invasive testing and to treat a patient uh, uh, based upon the data uh, that is uh, provided, um, that we provide um, to our, our physicians. Uh, uh, in about 200 centers in the United States, uh, including actually just a few weeks ago at UCSF, um, and, um, and also uh, in uh, the UK and uh, Japan. That's, that's a great story, Charlie. Very exciting. Uh, great validation. So next up, uh, Ohad Ar Ar Arazi, sorry, uh, from uh, Zebra Medical Imaging. Ohad. You're on mute. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to stand beside these other great companies. Um, we're with Zebra Medical Vision. I'm the CEO of the company and uh, Zebra is on a mission. We're on a mission to transform patient care by teaching computers to automatically read and diagnose medical imaging studies. Medical imaging is already established as one of the most critical and influential domains in healthcare. Over 3.6 billion imaging scans are taken across the globe every year, dealing with almost every type of, of medical condition. And the challenge is that with the continuous growth in medical imaging volumes and complexity, we're quickly reaching the human limit for effective interpretation of these images. So Zebra is looking to empower healthcare providers to manage the ever-increasing workload without compromising quality of care through the use of AI and machine learning. The way our technology works is that we receive a copy of all the scans that are taken at a particular hospital, and our software reviews the images and provides an initial diagnosis even before the radiologist has ever looked at the exam. Let me give you an example of how this comes to life. 
Uh, let's say a patient comes into the ER with possible pneumonia. A chest CT would be taken and the radiologist will manually read the, the scan and confirm the diagnosis. But you know, what if, what if when we're looking at that same scan, an algorithm is running in the background that identifies additional findings with significant downstream impact on the patient's overall health? For example, like subtle vertebral fractures, which are a leading indicator for osteoporosis. You know, we've talked about cancer, we've talked about cardiovascular disease. Osteoporosis is an, another example of a very common preventable, it's the most common preventable cause of fractures actually impacting half of all women over the age of 50 and costing $52 billion to treat. Uh, but it's, it's highly treatable if detected early. So our solution increases detection rates for osteoporosis and, and for osteoporotic fractures by over 70%. That's an example of how AI-driven medical imaging improves the speed and pace with which data morphs into knowledge and action to reduce healthcare waste and misdiagnosis, to improve patient and provider satisfaction, and to drive down healthcare costs. Zebra has six FDA clearances, nine CE marks, dozens of peer-reviewed publications, but I'd say that it's our ability to help such a breadth of conditions, cardiovascular care, cancer, bone health, lung health, that really set us apart. You know, our, our product portfolio not only improves the efficiency and accuracy of, diagnostic, of diagnosing acute conditions, but also helps to proactively identify conditions that could, prevent, uh, that could be preventable and, and present uh, challenges in the future. Thank you. Very good, great. So as you see, four terrific companies in this category, right, Dan? Um, really impressive. Yep. Uh, I have no idea how uh, we're gonna advance companies to choose a finalist here, they're just too close, but uh, let's try. So let's start off first and just ask some questions. Uh, quickly, you know, we're gonna ask the same question to uh, all four companies. So we're gonna start off, and these should be very fast answers, 30 seconds each, guys. So, um, and you can go in order. We'll start with Echo. First question is, what are you doing to change the status quo? Um, so, you know, this is getting at value. How, what's the old way versus your way? So start yeah, with it's, a great, it's a great question. Uh, the, the old way is, uh, and is, is a really old way, it's 200 years old, uh, is using a traditional analog stethoscope and relying on a, almost a musically trained ear of a provider to pick up subtle abnormalities and heart sounds. And then even beyond that, be able to pick up subtle rhythm issues to see early signs of AFib. Uh, what we are doing is we are for the first time using the digitization of heart and lung sounds with AI to not only help the provider continue to hear with greater clarity, but be able to understand what they're listening to with a little bit of decision support. So where the average PCP may have the sensitivity and specificity of about 60% to pick up a heart murmur, our algorithm has a 90% sensitivity and specificity. So elevating that early detection so that we can get patients into the cardiology workflow, but still paying tribute to that 200 year old practice, which is putting the stethoscope on the patient's chest. We don't, we don't want to take that away. That's great. Sounds to me like you're going to save lives. Um, so this is good stuff. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Eric, same question for you. Yes, thank you. So today we detect cancer through one of two ways. We have screening available for a very small number of cancers. Three to, three to five cancers, depending on the uh, guidelines that you look at. And so we don't screen for the vast majority of cancers, which means that they generally are diagnosed because of clinical presentation, which means that we are detecting them at late stage. And that late stage detection, of course, can lead to a high mortality. So with a single blood test, we can now look at 50 types of cancers that at one time and try to detect those cancers actually before clinical presentation. That ability to detect cancers before clinical presentation gives us a better chance to detect cancers when they're at early stage, which of course will translate to improved survival from cancer. And it's really this paradigm of looking for multiple cancers that we don't look for currently and being able to detect them at an earlier stage, which will translate to a potential mortality reduction downstream. Uh, it's really exciting. Eric, uh, you know, Grail is super far out in this category. We're very excited about what you guys are doing and making a huge impact on early detection of cancer is really going to make a, you know, a transformative change. So very excited about that. Uh, all right. Same question to you, Charlie. Sorry, it's muted. Uh, currently the diagnosis of coronary disease is primarily done with a non-invasive functional tests. It's the first non-invasive test. It could be an exercise treadmill, a stress echo or a nuclear uh, perfusion test. What is remarkable about these tests is that if, if these tests are positive and you take a patient to a further invasive assessment, 
the majority of time you won't find disease. So you'll actually have false positives over 50% of the time. The other issue is, is that when the test is negative, patients are often falsely reassured. They have significant, sometimes life-threatening heart disease, and they're sent home. Um, for example, a large one of our customers, a large healthcare provider in the Southeast, calls their test of choice, Stress Echo. The cardiologists literally call it the coin flip test, but they do it about a thousand times a month for the patients because there's really nothing better. Um, so with our, our approach, which starts with the CT to directly image the coronary arteries and then uses AI to be able to extract a very precise uh, representation of the disease in the coronary arteries and whether it's limiting uh, the blood supply to the muscle of the heart, physicians gonna, can get a very accurate diagnosis. Uh, we've proven that in head-to-head -head studies against the other tests and have proven that we have a better diagnostic performance. And there are very few patients uh, that have a negative uh, heart flow test that, uh, that would have a false negative. In fact, of 60,000 patients, we've only had three reportable adverse events uh, to the FDA, which is pretty remarkable for a cardiac diagnostic test. Um, so patients are, get physicians get the right uh, information they need to properly diagnose their patient. Yeah, no, that's terrific. And, you know, following kind of a similar trend here, you know, you're doing that non-invasively, which is, yeah. you know, which is a huge impact. All right, Charlie, thank you. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Ohad. Uh, tell us, uh, tell us again, uh, you know, old way versus the new way here at Zebra. Yeah, you, you know, the status quo for radiology is that we churn everything through the radiologist pipeline, right? One radiologist on average reads about 50 CT studies a day. Each study has about 400 images. That's 20,000 images per day. Over an eight hour day, that means that each radiologist spends roughly 1.6 seconds reviewing every image. Uh, there's a lot more data there of 1.6 seconds worth of review. So, so re we're really view viewing ourselves as the first company to use imaging AI to take on the challenge of population health, which is really core to the triple aim framework and to all of value-based care. And so our, our platform is a proven solution that can help assess and stratify patient risk that can guide clinical decisions, can guide interventions, can also drive better and more appropriate reimbursement using images that have already been taken. If I gave the example earlier of, of the, the CT chest and of pneumonia, so using the same exam to look at multiple aspects of the patient risk, that's, that's the new way, right? Bringing it all together, we can help diagnose cardiac conditions while we're looking at their osteoporotic fractures as well as improved cancer detection. You know, while that same patient was being diagnosed for pneumonia, while we were detecting their compression fracture, our coronary calcium scoring algorithm was also assessing the degree of plaque buildup in their aorta and providing a coronary calcium score which helped us to manage the risk for cardiovascular disease. So that's the power of AI. And I think unlocking the value of these medical images is really key to what the new way is going to look like. Yeah, no, agreed. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of say commonly, you know, from all these companies, you know, Zebra, Grail, Heartflow, Echo, all four of you are, are doing something that, you know, is augmenting what the physicians are doing today, what the clinicians are doing today. Um, and picking up disease that, you know, people weren't seeing before just because we're just human, right? And there's only so much we can do. So, you know, really, really pretty exciting uh, in the opportunity. All right, I'm going to hand it off to Dan for the next question. Great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, amazing technologies. Now, you're all addressing very big problems with um, both a human and an economic toll. So my question for you is tell us why your problem is the big problem to solve and uh, quantify your impact, both in terms of what, what would you expect for your impact in terms of outcomes and uh, dollars saved? So yes. let's start again with Echo. We'll keep the order if that works for you guys. Sure, it's a, it's a great question. And I'm not gonna try to make the argument that heart disease is a bigger problem than cancer or, uh, or uh, you know, any other chronic condition other than, as was stated earlier, it is the number one uh, killer in the world. And I think it really comes down to being able to detect it earlier. And with so much of these chronic conditions, getting patients into the right line of care faster so that you can put the patient on the appropriate therapeutic. You can do, if it's valve disease, a valve replacement. Uh, if it's a heart failure patient, get them on, you know, appropriate home-based remote monitoring program. So at ECHO, I mean, we really believe that if you can find patients in the mild to moderate uh, valve disease or heart failure space and get that patient into the cardiologist's office sooner, uh, you have the potential to both extend their life to save tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to the, to the payer in an earlier intervention 
and then ultimately improve the overall population of your, your the overall health of your patient population. So in terms of, of scope and scale, you know, the, the thing that, that we really value is that there is that 30 second exam built into every wellness and physical exam. So it is omnipresent in that the stethoscope is around the neck of almost every provider and every specialty. Um, but it really does rely on that downstream cardiology uh, intervention, both in terms of patient follow on and therapeutic and uh, medical device intervention to be able to really close the loop on, on managing those patients. That's great. Excellent. And now Eric at Grail. Um, how about, uh, why is Grail solving a big problem and is this a trillion dollar problem and why? So we've we talked a little bit about the fact that we're detecting cancer at late stage, which leads to high mortality. And it's been estimated that even a 1% reduction in cancer mortality could be worth $695 billion in terms of lost productivity, quality of life, and other uh, economic impact. So even achieving a 1% reduction in cancer mortality would have a huge economic benefit in addition to obviously the, the health benefit of, of improving outcomes from cancer. And so with, with our technology and our ability to detect multiple cancers uh, at an earlier stage, we will impact a stage shift. And that stage shift will translate to a reduction of mortality. And our modeling suggests that over five years, we could reduce cancer mortality by about 39%. And so the math is fairly straightforward that if we are successful, there will be a huge economic impact let alone the uh, untold uh, extra number of lives that we're able to save from cancer. That's great. <clears throat> Excellent. And keeping in keeping with the minimally invasive and non-invasive approaches, Charlie, can you talk a little bit about heart flow and where you think you um, generate the most value? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, coronary artery disease is the primary reason why people die of uh, heart disease. It's about $300 billion per year just in the United States. And the issue is that with the changing demographics, of course, people are living longer. We have more patients that are of the age where they have a higher prevalence of heart disease and cancer. These costs are just increasing. Uh, this is one of the, um, it turns out that the current diagnostic tests are, you know, as assessed by MedPAC, uh, the most wasteful procedures that Medicare is paying for right now, uh, believe it or not. Um, our test, when it's used, saves, and this has been uh, documented in published papers, about $3,500 per patient uh, with heart disease. So you translate that you know, to the m millions of patients that, um, that are uh, getting diagnosis for heart disease. It's a massive impact just in, our, in the U.S. Uh, healthcare system in terms of cost savings. Um, I think ultimately though, patients, you know, I, I think cancer is a more difficult problem to tackle, quite frankly, than heart disease because early diagnosis, being able to image, identify patients early, put them on appropriate and aggressive medical therapy can really, I think, make a difference in actually reducing uh, death due to heart disease. And I think it is, a, it is something that in our lifetimes, I hope that we'll be able to, as I said, knock it down from, its, uh, from the leading cause of death. Um, but it's going to come out with better, earlier di non-invasive diagnostic tests uh, that can be used to make uh, the best appropriate and most appropriate uh, clinical decisions uh, for each patient. Sounds great. Excellent. Uh, amongst great company. So, and Ohad, how about you? What, what is the impact of Zebra and um, how, how can we expect it to be a trillion dollar company? Well, it's truly fascinating to hear the different perspectives from heart flow, echo, and grail, and, and such important statements around the, you know, cardiovascular disease and, and cancer. And, you know, as I stated earlier with Zebra, because we're in the field of diagnostics and, and medical imaging, we really bring it all together. I, I mentioned, you know, 3.6 billion scans are taken across the globe every year. They deal with almost every type of medical condition. Roughly 30% of these scans had missed findings because radiologists are rushed, because they're not always able to focus, or they're focusing on one thing and not on everything. You know, I gave an example of bone health, with osteoporosis. I gave an example of a coronary calcium and the impact of that to cardiovascular disease. Uh, cancer is another area where, you know, if we could get earlier intervention in the diagnostic process, we could alleviate substantial downstream challenges. Uh, I'll share an amazing stat, you know, dur during the outbreak of coronavirus, annual mammography testing during lockdown were postponed or canceled. And so every day from mid-March to mid-May, over a period of 60 days, an average of 94,000 mammograms were deferred daily because women didn't come in to get their mammograms. So that means that 6 million patients experience increasing anxiety 
waiting to be tested and ran the risk of missing early detection component of their annual screening. Uh, AI can solve that by going over their prior scans and ensuring that we have a second read, that we have early detection of cancer. So from our perspective, we're really touching every aspect of healthcare. This is truly you know, a trillion dollar industry globally. And I think you know, in line with everything that's been said by the other companies, you know, the earlier we can intervene, the earlier we can find disease, and the more comprehensive view we can provide of that patient, not the one thing the radiologist is looking for, but rather the entire picture, and AI can do that, we believe will have a substantial impact that way. That's great. And all, all four of you companies, I, I love that you're nailing the triple aim of improving outcomes, reducing cost, and expanding access to care, which is, uh, once you're hitting on all three of those cylinders, it's going to be a grand slam. So you mentioned coronavirus. I'm going to hand that off to Paul to ask you the final question here. Sure. Uh, thanks, Dan. And, and by the way, so for anyone who hasn't figured it out yet, if you want to put questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, Dan and I will ask those questions um, after we answer this one uh, for the remaining 10 minutes of this session. So uh, last question of the pre-prepared questions, which is COVID. Uh, we're in a pandemic and COVID has really changed everything. So in your particular company's case, how has COVID shined a light on what it is that you do? So we'll go in the same order. We'll stick with that and not throw you guys off. Uh, so Jason, tell us about Echo and how COVID's impacted you and what you've done and uh, maybe shine a light on what it is that makes you special. Sounds good. COVID has really shaped auscultation and cardiac disease screening and, and our role in that in two major ways. The first is how physicians even listen to heart and lung sounds. Imagine walking into a, a suspected COVID or COVID positive room, fully gowned up in PPE, and then having to use a 24 inch rubber tube to get right in front of a patient to listen to their heart and lung sounds. It's not necessarily uh, the best infection control practice. So what ECHO has allowed providers to do really for the first time is remove the ear tube from the stethoscope. So the patient can hold the stethoscope or someone fully gowned up can hold the stethoscope while the provider is actually listening to the heart and lung sounds from a safe distance. Um, even if the provider is fully gowned up, they can wear AirPods and actually listen to the heart and lung sounds wirelessly under their protective gear. So we've really, this is a use case that no, no one really could have imagined uh, blowing up in the way that it has, but it's been a huge difference maker to providers. The second uh, is patients aren't coming in as often, they're stuck at home. And so the need to do video visits has obviously exploded, but video visits isn't sufficient for a patient with heart failure or COPD. So we've had many of our providers send our devices to patient homes and actually coach them through what we call self-auscultation. So they take our device, they hold it up to their chest and it augments the video visit so the cardiologist or pulmonologist can get what they really need, which is the heart sounds and the lung sounds. So those two use cases, the patients stuck at home and the providers having to reimagine how they even see patients in the clinic have really uh, been great kind of new applications of our product. And were you, were you already in the home before COVID or did COVID really push you there? It, it pushed us uh, exponentially further into the home. We were exploring how our product could be used for heart failure patients over longer monitoring periods. But what, what we realized is for already, you know, any cardiovascular disease patient who's now stuck at home trying to do a, a quarterly or regular visit with their provider, that provider needed the ability to listen to their heart and lung sounds and we could, we could solve that gap. Great, thank you. Um, Eric, over Grail, same question. So how has COVID changed things for Grail and how has it shined a light, uh, shown a light on what you're doing there at Grail? So as I had to uh, describe, we're in the middle of a huge natural uh, health experiment where uh, access to screening is uh, diminished. And in fact, modeling data from the UK has indicated that this uh, COVID event has, as it's led to decreased um, access to screening, will lead to an increase in mortality of close to 10% for breast cancer, over 10% for colorectal cancer. And these additional deaths are really a reflection of a more broad phenomenon, both brought to light by COVID, but also just in general, which is access to screening. And so a blood test for multiple types of cancers, we believe exponentially increases that access to screening on several fronts. First of all, it is a blood test, which, and there are obviously thousands and thousands of blood, blood collection centers all across uh, the world. Second, it tests for multiple cancers with one blood draw. And so instead of having to go for a test for cancer A, another test for cancer B, and a third a test for cancer C, and so forth, 
we can test for up to 50 cancer types in one single blood draw. And so this conversation around COVID, I think should be broadened to a conversation about access to uh, cancer screening modalities and a blood test for multiple cancers really helps fill this unmet need. Well, I hate taking multiple blood draws, so um, I'm glad that you're doing more in one. So thank you for that. Um, but it sounds like this has really been impactful. Um, all right, uh, and then Charlie, heart flow. Yeah, um, I would say one of, the, you. one of the most surprising things I think about COVID that was seen at, actually first by some of our investigators in Italy and now has been seen across the country, for instance, in Northern California, is, is quite frankly, the fear of COVID is keeping a lot of patients with heart disease out of hospitals, also cancer. Um, and the problem with that is that many of the patients wait too long. They end up presenting at the emergency department. They have an ST elevation MI, and and you know the the rate of, of those has gone up dramatically. Um, so I, th this is the first impact that it had for us. But but quickly we applied for emergency use authorization from uh, the FDA to do uh, apply our test in non ST elevation MI patients. Um, because of the fact that it's often confusing if a patient is presenting you know, with some of this, these symptoms to, to really be able to rule out coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction as quickly as possible uh, is very important. Now, one of the th benefits of CT, it's a, it's a much less, uh, involves much less uh, patient provider physician contact than other tests where, for instance, you're walking, you're exerting yourselves, you're breathing on the, on the nurse, for instance, that's administering the test. Um, so CT is very easy to perform. It's very easy to clean a cardiac CT scanner. And our test requires absolutely zero patient encounter. It's just the CT data is acquired and it's then transmitted to us and then we process it. So um, we've uh, seen, you know, uh, I would say, except for the kind of initial dip that happened, um, but because of fear of COVID, uh, we've, we've uh, been uh, growing very robustly in part because we have a very minimally, you know, uh, the pathway that we have involves very little um, uh, impact or encounter uh, with the uh, patient um, and our, our technology is completely virtual. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you took advantage of the EUA. Um, that's really yeah. good to hear. Um, all right. Uh, just in the interest of time, we're going to move on now to uh, Ohad. Uh, same question for you, COVID. Um, How has it impacted things over at Zebra? Yeah, it's definitely uh, taken us in different directions. And, and what we've seen is that, that most efforts to fight the pandemic to date have been on characterizing the virus or testing or, or developing, obviously, vaccines to it. What we've seen that there's been very little to help the health systems understand the potential for disease progression in patients. And that's important in terms of creating the best care plan. You know, if you look at one of the greatest drivers of coronavirus-related mortality is the inability to detect early potential severe cases and provide critical care to those that need it most. Healthcare providers need automated tools to support triage and to determine how to best allocate their ER capacity, their ICU beds, their ventilators, based on disease progression. I think Italy, which was mentioned, you know, serves as a cautionary tale where the frontline providers had to make very difficult decisions about who they think had the greatest need to receive treatment. And so in response to that, Zebra's developed software for a machine learning algorithm that analyzes CT scans. Uh, our software automatically detects and quantifies suspected COVID-19 findings while providing a lung burden score, basically a calculation of the percentage of the affected lung volume. That helps providers to better predict the trajectory of patients with COVID-19 as a decision support for the allocation of, of ER and, and ICU resources. And we developed that based on, on, uh, on data we had for, um, for GGOs, which are ground glass opacities. They're basically an, an imaging feature of COVID pneumonia. Uh, and, and so we, we segment that data. We've, our researchers and engineers use clinical data from, from thousands of medical images to train the model. And then we validated that against confirmed COVID-19 CT scans. And so our software ultimately provides key insights into the disease severity that allows doctors to, to diagnose, to triage, and to evaluate patients swiftly and, and effectively. Terrific. Um, Let's see if we got a screen being shared over here. Um, I'm just going to uh, talk for one second. Uh, hopefully, Mark is still here. Uh, maybe you can. That screen share is looking strange. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, just overall, great companies, great needs. Uh, hospital diagnostics, you know, are completely being transformed by these companies. As you can hear, um, we have uh, a bunch of questions in the Q and A box. We're not going to have time to get to, unfortunately, because this is the end of the panel. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Mark to close up. The session. 
You're on mute. Mark, you're muted. Mark, oh yeah, you can't hear. Okay, there you go, yep. I'm, see, I'm trying to run and to walk. Um, first of all, Paul and Daniel, you guys are, uh, did your thing. This was great. Um, these are four amazing companies. Do you guys want to do a quick wrap and then I'll just uh, uh, talk about a few of the logistics at the end? Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. So, you know, we've got, you know, I'm just going to make, you know, a general comment here, which is, again, that, um, you know, what you're seeing here are, you know, the ability to detect things that we weren't seeing with humans alone. Um, I mentioned that a little bit uh, before um, and, and to dramatically increase kind of the, you know, the, in, you know, the ability to um, react to these, these things quickly. Um, you know, these are all companies that are using digital. These aren't just, you know, tests. Um, so the ability to generate the data that's going to transform care that really is going to prove the value because ultimately you can build something and it could work, but if you can't prove the value, then, you know, it's never going to be successful. And all four of these companies are doing that. So that's the thing that strikes me is, you know, they're well, you know, they're well along their way to, uh, the, you know, transforming care by, by being able to prove the value of these technologies. And, and that's why I think they all deserve to be in this category. Dan? Yep. <clears throat> I definitely agree. I, um, I'm confident that all four of these companies are going to be a big success, and I'm looking forward to it not only as a patient myself, but also as a clinician. I think it's going to be the both human and economic toll of everything you're working on is extraordinarily high, and I'm, I expect great things from all of you. I appreciate you coming being on the panel. Well, great. Well, thank you. We're going to call this a wrap. Is uh, you guys? You guys are. I couldn't have uh, said it said it better. What's in a week? Our grand finale is in a week. That's on the 23rd. We're, we're purposely doing it from uh, 6 to 7.30. Obviously, it'll be recorded if you can't do it, but we were asked to pick this time. The whole idea is this is going to be a celebration. We, we're targeting 10,000 people to be online and to watch this show. We're going to have a number of surprise guests. It's going to be a 90-minute show to really celebrate you know, a lot of the good things that are going on in a really shitty year. And... Uh, so the idea is this is a celebration. If you haven't signed up, if people from your company haven't signed up, send them, send them to our uh, ucsfhealthawards.com slash join website, uh, blog it, tweet it, do your whatever your thing is, the more the merrier. And uh, good luck to all you guys. And uh, you let, look, you're all total winners. And uh, have, a great, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, right. guys. Thank you so much. Well, thank Bye. you. Guys. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thank Perfect you. work. Thanks, everyone.